Today, the property story from soup to nuts. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. As you know, I cover the property market from top to bottom and I do a lot of analysis. I had an opportunity to present the analysis from soup to nuts for a recent show with Harry Dent. And this is the full version. Some of the material you've seen before, but there's a lot of new information. And for the first time, I tell the entire story. Uh, thanks for spending some time with me. And I thought this chart might just uh, give you a bit of a sense of what I think about real estate, right? Which is essentially we're hanging on, we're hanging on by our fingernails. But unfortunately, the data I'm going to share with you today really suggests that uh, there are some significant issues to think about and uh, action is required if you're going to be able to protect your wealth and uh, make the right decisions for your family's future. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run through um, a few slides here and um, I'm going to go quite quick. Uh, some of this material I've shared before but there's quite a lot of new material too and uh, what I want to do is just give you some headline numbers to start with just to get everyone on the same page. We'll go into some more detailed analysis based on my survey We'll then look at some real examples of property because one of the things I want you to take from this is that property doesn't always go up and in fact there is evidence that property is falling quite fast in some areas and we're going to look at some real examples just to make that point. And then I'll share with you my latest scenario so you can see what I'm thinking about property price movements and uh, that'll pretty much tie it up. I'm going to talk for about an hour and I'll touch on some of the implications of the analysis. So just in terms of uh, some top level data, Kimsa Confidence is down again. This is the latest from Roy Morgan. Fell another 1.9%. It sort of came back after the um, uh, drop in March, but uh, unfortunately, Melbourne's uh, situation and the broader spiral of the virus is uh, driving it down again. Consumers are not happy. Uh, and Westpac's leading index is also down as well. The leading index shows a whole bunch of information together from business, from consumer, from investment. And basically, what they're saying is, boy, we're in trouble. And unfortunately, I have to agree with them on that. Um, if you actually uh, look at some of the areas of pain, uh, the Treasury came out yesterday and said that uh, now 41.9 billion is being sucked out of super funds. They thought cast 29.5% previously. It's a lot higher. Uh, a lot of people are grasping that super. Some of it they're putting into savings. Some of it is going directly to pay. Uh, but that's a sign of stress, of course. And uh, many younger people are actually running their superannuation funds down to zero. Maybe, OK, short term creates issues longer term. Now, in terms of dwelling approvals, the latest data that came out this week showed that dwelling approvals are down. So in other words, more property starts are not going. Um, they're actually uh, dropping quite quickly, both units and houses. It's consistent across all states and territories pretty much. And this is a further sign of more stress. No surprise then why it is that all of the um, governments, both state and federal, are essentially trying to stimulate construction by bribing people to go and buy property now. And I keep saying, be very, very careful because these bribes, whilst they might be attractive to individual buyers, you know, first time buyers and other people are actually all about trying to reconstruct the construction sector rather than actually helping you to get into the property market. So be really careful. Now, in terms of the economic downturn, it is uncertain ahead. This is the latest Treasury data from last week. And they said that the uh, size of the debt in Australia is going to be, this is government debt, uh, $851 billion next year. But more importantly, unemployment will be at 9% by the end of the year and GDP will be way down. 9% unemployment, and now that's the official number. And of course, before the COVID happened, we were at five and a bit. But remember that the economy was already sick. We were already seeing unemployment rising. We were already seeing stresses and strains in the system. The COVID has not created a problem. The COVID has catalyzed the underlying issues that were there. In fact, some of Harry's observations about uh, you know the bubble and the way the bubble's been running, the COVID has not created the price crisis. The COVID has triggered the correction, which was always going to come at some point. And in fact, the correction was very much staved off thanks to money printing and all the other incentive schemes that governments have done. But they 
cannot stop this forever. And at nine point something percent unemployment, if you're lucky, um, that's going to signal a huge amount of distress in the economy and a huge number of people out of work. And by the way, it's across all states, not just um, one or two, wherever you look. And this is the uh, comparison of May to June. You can see there that every state is higher. And I'd highlight that even some of the big states, Victoria and New South Wales, are both seeing unemployment rates um, 7, 7 plus. Um, WA and South Australia, of course, up too. But these big states are going to see and it's going to be a problem. And just another one, this is from the ABS showing that if you take underutilization, in other words, the people who haven't got the work they wanted, um, they're expecting it to sit around 20%. Uh, that's where it's reported now. All of these numbers are underreporting the true reality. I think unemployment in reality is closer to 15% uh, from all my data. And uh, just remind you that the government stimulus, although it was huge in the third quarter 20, 100 billion plus in the quarter, um, next quarter it's going to drop to about 20 billion and the quarter beyond that currently uh, it'll be um, around 5 billion. So understand that the stimulus uh, is not going to continue at the rate that it has been. And that's going to put more downward pressure on the economy, more downward pressure on household budgets and on businesses, and more downward pressure on real estate. So whilst the old adage that the government will save us, the RBA will always um, you know, rescue us, um, there are limits to what um, government stimulus is going to do because they are dying it back, not actually extending it. And I think personally, they're making a major mistake here because we have not addressed the virus. We have not addressed the fundamental economic issues that we're seeing. And yet it seems that people are quite uh, comfortable to say, well, you know, it'll be fine. No, it won't be fine. This is going to be a long, slow grind. No V-shaped recovery here. This is going to be a two to five year grind. And during that time, people will lose their jobs. People will lose their houses and uh, the debt and defaults will be rising. So that's why people need to be careful and cautious at the moment. Migration, forget migration. Migration's been turned off. And uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, until the borders are actually open, which probably won't be for months and months, the airline industry is talking three to five years to recover. Um, we're not going to see a massive amount of migration. A lot of the property sector has been supported by migration. The fact of the matter is that migration has actually pretty much slowed to a crawl. Now, in terms of the overseas market, uh, of course, overseas buyers were very active in the market previously, but the latest data from NAB shows that demand for new property and for established property from overseas buyers is down, way down. And like I said, migration being what it is, the lack of students, the lack of international means essentially that everybody is going to be struggling to uh, support the property market. So you can cross off your list international purchases. And by the way, you can cross off your list property investors, as I'll show you shortly, which means that the demand for property is falling. And just remember this, there are 1.2 million vacant properties in Australia now, 1.2 million out of about 10 million. That's a figure that people don't want to hear, but it's true. We've got lots of vacant property. Some of that is owned by overseas um, property purchases from years ago. Some of it's actually owned as second homes, but a lot of it is actually just vacant. A lot of that vacant stuff is high rise in and around our local cities. Now, the other point to make there is the housing turnover rate has dropped significantly. This is the amount of sales on the market. This is from the RBA. And uh, that's very important. So the sl sluggish market, it's been slowing actually since 2014, 15. It's been going down. And of course, now it's even worse. Now, prices, well, even CoreLogic saying prices are down. So if you look at the red figures, or if you can see the screen there, down 1.8%. 1.88% in Sydney over the last quarter on average, Melbourne down 3.22% on average, Brisbane down 0.57%, Adelaide down, uh, sorry, Adelaide up 0.37%, so it's bucking the trend. Perth over the last year down 21.8% on average and down 2 point something percent in the last quarter, all the majors down 2%. Now these averages are masking huge differences and in some places, you'll see that, in fact, the differences are massive and uh, the falls are very significant, as I'll show you later. Now, 
CoreLogic's also suggesting the rate of decline is easing a bit. Well, we'll see about that. Um, I don't see any evidence in any of the data that I've got that, in fact, is the case. But uh, these indices are deceptive. In some cases, they're actually reporting information from weeks um, ago. They're partially disclosing information because a lot of price sales are actually now not disclosed by the agents when they sell. And we also have very low volume, so be careful with the, the various um, data points. And that's true for auctions as well as for prices. Mm -hmm. And talking about auction results, this is from SQM. They probably have the better handle on what's really going on with regards to auction clearance rates. 46% in Sydney, 35% in Melbourne. Way lower, way lower than the official quote-unquote statistics from places like Domain and CoreLogic. Don't believe that, that data, the SQN data, is much closer to reality. And of course, credit momentum is easing. So remember that we've got huge household debt. Harry mentioned it earlier on about consumer debt. Household debt is massive in Australia. And the fact of the matter is that we've got one of the highest debt burdens in the household sector, close to 200% debt to income ratio, uh, second or first, depending on what measures you use. But the momentum with regards to lending is dropping. You can see here the aggregates for May from the RBA. And it's true for business. It's true for housing lending. And of course, it's true also for personal lending. So credit is easing. And that's a big deal because the rate of change of credit is a forward indicator of what happens to home prices. And by the way, rental listings are way up in Melbourne and the ACT. So they're up 16.3%. Uh, in total listings up 5.6% and new listings in Melbourne and up 3.4% uh, for total listings and up 0.9% for new listings. Um, and also up, by the way, in the ACT, 9.6% up in the ACT. We've got masses and masses of rental properties available. And that's one of the reasons why rental properties now are dropping significantly in terms of the value that people have to pay to rent and therefore, many property investors are now getting seriously bruised. Now, let me just touch on my mo modelling. So we, we survey households, 52,000 households times 140 fields, and we run rolling surveys. So the information I'm showing today is all very recent, and uh, that feeds our blogs, it feeds our other analysis, and pretty much all that we do. And we can slice and dice the data all sorts of different ways. And uh, I want to start with just with my own confidence index. So this confidence index is tracking how households feel about their finances. And you can see there that there was a peak back in 2016. The uh, dotted line at 100 is the average, the long-term average. So we've actually been in negative territory for most of the last four or five years. But we are down now to 76.9. That's as low as it's been on the index. And uh, the reason for that is that um, households are very concerned about their financial footprint. Not surprisingly, high unemployment, uh, income costs, pressure, and also now, of course, worrying about property prices. Now, in fact, the stock market recovery has helped some segments. And so we can split them by those mortgage, those renting, those who are called free affluence. Free affluence have property and stocks and shares, but no debt. And it's the free affluence who are actually experiencing a rise, thanks to stock markets. But those who are mortgaged and those who are renting see very, very negative signs ahead. Um, Victoria is leading the way down uh, after the lockdown. The smaller states are up at the moment, but that, uh, that may change. Um, the point I want to make here is that um, uh, whether you like it or not, we've got um, a common thread running through lower levels of confidence in our major centres, and that's a big deal in terms of the market ahead. Now, if you look at property investors, they are the most negative at the moment. So they were really bullish in through 2016-17, but uh, now effectively the uh, property investors, which is the sort of the lighter blue line, is right at the bottom. Property um, active owner occupiers are a little more positive than they were, but only slightly, and that's to do with the fact that mortgage rates have dropped dramatically. And inactive um, uh, property owners, sorry, inactive property people, which are renters and people living in families, are, are also very uh, concerned about what's going on. But I want to make the point: property investors are absolutely worried about what's going on at the moment. 
Now, if you look at it across the age bands, you'll see there that in fact it's the older and younger household groups that are actually the most um, concerned. Um, those uh, you know slightly older with perhaps less debt and slightly more assets are slightly less concerned. It's all relative, but nevertheless, the fact is that if you're younger, 20 to 30 or 30 to 40 or over 60, then you're really feeling it at the moment. Now, job security, if you start looking at the individual elements within the index, job security is a big deal. Um, there is a huge spike in those feeling less secure. Nearly 70% of people are feeling less secure at their jobs than a year ago. That's a big deal. And that's partly less hours, partly less jobs, and partly higher unemployment. And I'm talking about now structural unemployment. This is not going to bounce back quickly. Remember 9.5% by the end of the year, or 9.25% or whatever it is by the end of the year, it means people are going to have issues with jobs. Incomes are still hugely under pressure. And again, it's the uh, uh, orangey red chart uh, line that says those have fallen. You can see there that 65% uh, of households have had their real income drop in the last 12 months, a massive jump. And the cost of living, well, no, the cost of living continues to rise. The CPI was negative, reported earlier this week. Uh, but, of course, the CPI doesn't tell the full story with regard to the cost of living. Many people are actually struggling. And uh, close to 95% are saying, in real terms, after inflation, my costs of living have risen over the last year. Debt, of course, remains a significant problem. And not surprisingly, therefore, there are more people really worried about their debt levels. Uh, more than 60% are saying, I'm really concerned about this debt, how I'm going to deal with it. That includes mortgage debt, personal debt, and credit card debt. That's one of the reasons why many are paying down if they can. Um, now, whilst interest rates are low, and therefore it's sort of serviceable for some, the size of the debt and the quantum of the debt is a, is a huge deal. Now, savings, of course, are also under pressure, and that's partly because the interest rates on deposits are really, really low. And uh, also people are raiding their savings to be able to get by. And as a result of that, um, people are putting more money into savings if they can. They're putting more money into uh, offset uh, mortgage accounts if they can to try and reduce their debt burden. But savings is a bit of a mugs game with returns on term deposits now as low as they've been. And by the way, the banks are continuing to screw term deposit holders because essentially they're trying to support the lending side of their business. Remember that banks have had a 60 basis point gift in terms of a cut to their funding, thanks to what the Reserve Bank has been doing in their three-year funding. But that 60% basis points has all gone to cut loan rates. Depositors are getting absolutely nothing. So savings is a real problem. And not surprisingly, then, if you put all that together, net worth is wilting, although it's supported by stocks, if in fact you're stockholders. But nevertheless, nearly 70% of households have a lower net worth now than a year ago. And that's huge because what that means is that there is wealth destruction in place and wealth destruction leads to um, a feedback loop of less confidence, less spending. Less spending leads to less economic growth. Remember, half of the economy is consumer spending with consumer spending down. That then drives a further feedback loop. And so my expectation is that we're going to see net worth continuing to drive lower as property prices fall. Stocks will come off their highs, as Harry says, at some point later in the year. And that means that we're going to see further falls. Now, let me come on to mortgage and rental stress because that's a really big deal. And uh, we define it in cash flow terms. We look at money in, money out. And that includes salary, pensions, dividends, everything else. We also look at uh, all the payments going out for everything. So we look at it on a holistic basis. So not just looking at the mortgage, but looking at everything. And uh, we also look at um, uh, you know, what happens to um, uh, discretionary spending as well as non-discretionary spending. Now, some will have assets like um, investments. But of course, my perspective is that if cash flow is zero or below, then households are in stress. And if they're 10% below, they're in severe stress. And severe stressed households ultimately will have to do something big. If they've got property, they may have to sell. Um, often there's a correlation between mortgage stress and two or three years down the track when mortgage stress turns into defaults. And uh, I've used um, lots of examples. Uh, you know, People can mitigate short term by cutting back on spending, drawing on deposits, putting more on credit cards, etc. But nevertheless, if you look at, for example, Western Australia case studies, Mandra, there three or four years ago, mortgage stress started to go really high. And now property prices are down 38%. We've got more property owners in negative equity, more trying to sell. And frankly, the social consequences of that are plain to see if you go down the streets of Mandra. So mortgage stress in June rose to 
its all-time high of 39.1%. In February, it was 32.9%. So let's be clear, that's more than 1.47 households impacted. And my projection is that by August next month, it could be as high as 40.3%. Um, we expect it to go higher. It's structural. It's to do with unemployment. And whilst the job keeper and job seeker have helped and the postponements have helped and the switch to ro lower rates and the switch to interest only have helped on the margin, many people are struggling. And of course, the banks have been saying there's a considerable number of people, they set, let's say 10% of mortgage holders who are basically trying to uh, postpone their repayments or trying to restructure, renegotiate. Remember, the banks have a three to four month window between September and January to negotiate with individual property holders with a mortgage and basically confirm whether they can or whether they can't recommence their repayments. If not, then what APRA has said is you've got to actually talk to them about selling their property before they default. So this is a big deal. Now, by the states, um, this data is uh, showing you that it's Tasmania who actually has the highest proportion at 49.4%. The average across the country is 39.1%, but you can see there across pretty much all the major centres, the proportion of stress is pretty high. And look at the number. We're talking at more than 400,000 in New South Wales. We're talking at more than 400,000 in Victoria. We're talking more than 250,000 in Queensland and the grand total 1.4 million households out of 3.78 uh, owner-occupied borrowing households in Australia. This is a big deal. Defaults will happen and people will have to sell and when they sell they will lose money. Now if you look at across our segments as you can do you can see there that uh, uh, it's the young growing families, new buyers, first-time buyers at 69.2 percent who are the most stressed, the battling urban, the disadvantaged fringe, well you know they're all people you might expect. But look at this, exclusive professionals, young affluent households, they have stress too. And wealthy seniors have stress. So wherever you look, you can see pockets of worry about maintaining those mortgage repayments. Remember that more people have mortgages going into retirement than ever before. A greater proportion have mortgages relative to those who are property uh, owners and mortgage free, thanks to the big debts that people have. So this is a recipe for disaster. And just a few examples of postcodes. Ballarat 3350 has the highest count of distressed households at the moment, uh, 6,994. Then we go over to Western Australia as a curtain, 6030, 6,950. Those are young growing families, whereas um, in Ballarat it's more mixed. And then we come across to Melbourne, and you can see there that the next four or five postcodes, like um, Sydenham, like Cranbourne, like Werribee and Derrimont, Point Cook, Pakenham, Hoppers Crossing, they're all in Melbourne, all in high growth areas and all highly stressed with more than 6,000 households there. And the risk default rates are very high as well. So we're going to see people being forced to sell, being forced to close. And then you can go down to the central tablelands and to Mackay and Adelaide and other places, Brisbane, Morton. The point I want to make is that mortgage stress is not just a Sydney and Melbourne problem. It's a regional and national problem. Pretty much everywhere you look, mortgage stress exists and it's putting huge pressure on households. Now, here's some examples, and I'm just going to quickly drill down here. This is actually a Sydney area. So basically, the stressed areas, the most stressed areas are the orange and the red. So you can see it's Western Sydney, places like that, that actually create the, um, the biggest issues. Um, I want to highlight that down here, uh, the more affluent areas, there's a few pockets, but it's nowhere near as high. Bear that thought in mind when I show you some more charts shortly. If I do the same for Melbourne, uh, you can see then, again, the uh, red and orange areas. You've got Ballarat over here. You've got uh, areas over um, towards the Dandelong area. And then you've got areas to the north of Melbourne. So again, it's a question of some areas of Melbourne are much more um, uh, impacted than others. But the fact is that there is very high stress in Melbourne. And even close in, if you look at 3000 and places like that, um, there are also some pockets there. And I'll come back to that shortly as I explain why that's the case. And we can go again around the, around the traps. Uh, this is actually now Brisbane. And again, you can see that uh, there are stressed areas, particularly uh, 
down around south and west. Ipswich, of course, is a, is, is a hot spot. Uh, you can also look at areas down on the Gold Coast and you can go up to Sunshine Coast as well. Uh, this is a big deal, but again, it's not uniform. There are some areas doing quite well. There are others doing less well. And just to complete the picture there, the ACT, whoops, the ACT went too fast. The ACT, uh, a few examples there, including some uh, quite stressed areas. Not uniform again, but uh, it's quite consistent that we see it even in the ACT, which you'd expect to be quite insulated because of all of the um, uh, government jobs there. And if you look at Hobart, again, you can see that there are pockets of stress. Now, that's explained partly by the fact that we've had huge runouts in property prices, very flat income growth. And now um, the holiday season pretty much turned off completely because of COVID. That's all having a huge impact. A lot of the economy in Hobart is actually driven by tourism and that pretty much has been turned off. So this is creating huge pressure. And some of those properties, by the way, are properties that were being let previously. And if I go to Adelaide, similar story. You can see then pockets of stress in certain locations. Um, again, not uniform. But it's pretty compelling when you actually start looking at this in detail. I spend quite a lot of my time looking at these maps because they do tell the story quite powerfully. So Perth there, you can see that, um, again, there are some issues with regard to uh, the stress levels. It's south and north of Perth, particularly on the coast, Rockingham further south, but also some areas closer in north of Perth. So again, this is, this is quite a big deal. Now, let me turn on to rental stress because this is another angle. So this is looking at people now who are renting rather than actually uh, uh, buying. And uh, they have um, the same story. So again, if you look at rental stress, the highest stress is in Tas uh, is Tasmania at 56%, then Victoria and New South Wales a bit lower. But 1.7 million households are in rental stress. So they're struggling to pay the rents. Now, for every rental stress, there's an investment property owner who potentially has rental not coming in. And of course, there are rental holidays at the moment. The question is, how long will those rental holidays actually be maintained? Good question. Uh, you can actually see it across the segments again. Similar story. So young growing families, 68% of those renting are also stressed. We've got the uh, disadvantaged fringe and the battling urban once again. And then we've got the young affluence um, still stressed. So wherever you look, you can see it across most of our segments. And in terms of top postcodes, Melbourne 3000 has 13,714 estimated in rental stress. That's the highest count in the country. That's 8% of all of those renting because there's a lot of property in and around Melbourne, of course, all the high rise. Um, that's a big deal. A lot of those were Airbnb. A lot of those were actually student accommodation, all gone. Um, uh, people, of course, uh, you know, basically not being supported by the government. So if you're a student, you may not get any support if international students still living here. And then you can go to 2560 like Campbelltown, places like that. Uh, and then you go to uh, Chipping Norton and Liverpool areas like that, 2170 in Sydney. And then uh, you can go to other areas too. And you can see there across the country, there are, you know, uh, places like 4350, uh, that's up in um, Queensland. You can go uh, across to uh, other areas too. And so pretty much across the country, you can see high levels of rental stress. But the Melbourne story is huge. And remember I said to you that there were lots of issues with regards to 3,000. Well, this is part of the story. Now, then I want to go on to probably investor stress. Now, this is new analysis that uh, I've shared very recently. And I've looked at those people who are owning property. So it's the other side, if you like, of um, investment. So if you're a property investor um, and your uh, rent is not being paid, you'll have a problem. So we have roughly 3.3 uh, million properties for rent across Australia. We have about 2.8 million property rental owners, and that includes individuals and uh, companies. And of that, we have around 833,000 stressed investors, um, and that basically is about 25% of all property investors. Now, that's a big deal, and you can see how they're spread across the country. And what I've done here is to think about not where they hold property, but where they live. So this is based on the living address of the property investor. 
And it's quite complicated to define this because you've got to think in um, different locations, you know, postcodes will, and the properties to their own. We also look at uh, the um, question of how defined stress is here. So we look at things like, is it vacant? Um, are they trying to sell? Um, have they got uh, less income coming in than they've got costs to, to serve? All those things are in there in the mix. And once again, you say a pretty interesting story. So are young growing families and multi-couple establishments are actually uh, up there in terms of the proportion of investors who are stressed. And uh, interestingly, some of the other segments like the battling urban and the disadvantaged fringe are less stressed, but then they have a much smaller holding relative to some of the others. Uh, but this is really interesting. Suburban mainstream property investors. So your mum and dad property investor, 25% of those are strolling with regard to the investment property. That's a huge deal, absolutely huge deal. And uh, my perspective is this, that that is going to be the source of huge pain ahead. Now, in terms of where they're most hit, 2010, which is essentially around the Surrey Hills area, followed by Millers Point, 2000, Randwick, 2031, and then down to Melbourne, Melbourne 3000. Well, there's a surprise. Melbourne 3000, as I showed, was the highest rent stress area. It's also one of the highest property investor stressed areas too. South Yarra, St Kilda, and then we come back to New South Wales, Rush Cushers Bay, and Newton, Cheswick, South Bank uh, in um, uh, Victoria as well. And then we come to the ACT. And what you can see here is, that, again, this is a story not just of a few centres. This is widespread across the country. Property investors are really catching a cold. And my survey suggests that about 12% of property investors are planning to sell in the next 12 months because they cannot make property investing work anymore. Now, again, I've got some mapping here. And uh, we'll look at Sydney first. So this is showing you where the stressed property investors live. And the obvious observation here is that it is the more affluent areas where property investors are most stressed. Remember that I showed you on the mortgage stress it was Western Sydney. No, this time it's in the more affluent areas. That is a big deal. And we can see the same also in Melbourne. Similar story, close in is where a lot of the property investors are stressed. This is massive because what it means is that more affluent households are now absolutely under the gun and are trying to decide what to do about their properties. And I see that in my individual surveys that say property investors are out of a, a time. More and more are saying we're going to try and get out. And in fact, if you look carefully, what's happening is that today more property investors are listing and they're trying to get first time buyers to buy them. So first time buyers are the patsies to help property investors get out. That's not a good story in my view, but that's what's happening in, in my experience based on the surveys. Again, Brisbane, um, you know, some of the more affluent areas close in, again, the most stressed from a, an investment perspective. And you can pretty much go into all the different locations. This is the ACT, and you can see a similar story. Again, it's close in. Again, there are many property investors in more affluent postcodes who are really struggling at the moment. And of course, the chances are this is not going to change and correct anytime soon, simply because rentals are way down. We've got more property listings in some places, for example, in, in, um, in Tasmania. Listings were up in the last quarter and the average rental dropped 9% in the last quarter. One reason why there are some pressures in and around Hobart. Not as much as you can see there, but nevertheless, there are still some areas where property investors are definitely under the pump. And we can look at Adelaide, see a somewhat similar story. Um, again, not quite as severe in the Adelaide area. Relatively. That's partly because the uh, property market is yet to settle in Adelaide, whereas in some other cases it's already well on the, on the way down. And we can also go across to uh, Perth and see similar things. And again, it's worth just noting that some of the more affluent postcodes close in in and around Perth are where a lot of the stresses and strains are. And I will just do Darwin here just to make the point that we do actually cover all territories and there are some small signs there. Darwin has had a huge fall in property for a long, long time and there are many investors who've bailed out already, others who are trying to bail out, very few new property investors buying in Darwin at the moment. Now, let me just go on to the final part of the conversation. Um, there's a, a, 
a lot of rubbish being written in the mainstream and you know this is realestate.com.au who basically say there are lots of views um, the fact is you are lots of people looking on their engines at the moment to look at property but it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to buy and to draw a bow from that to say well that means that everybody's looking to buy is rubbish and yet that is what is being reported just bear in mind that some of these places are connected to some of the mainstream media and so the mainstream media is peddling everything's fine the property market's buoyant etc etc it's rubbish it's not another example if you look at the uh, uh, cordonic uh, the hedonic index from CoreLogic, uh, what there you'll what you'll see is that the estimated value that they've got in their models are completely off relative to what is sold. That information is not being translated if in fact the sold value was lower. And what that means is that the indices are slow in reporting the truth and most of the data is probably one to two months old and it's partial. Don't believe the hedonics. It is out of time it does not actually give us a good handle you have to get granular you have to look at real value prices on the ground and just by the way this is from uh, Edwin one of the guys who comes on my channel sometimes makes the point that we've got listings now in Sydney 18,000 in the winter it's amazing this is freestanding homes that's very very high there are lots of property listings at the moment and we expect property listings to continue to rise because more people are being forced to sell the banks are getting a bit more antsy with mortgage holders property investors are trying to sell so this is all a story I think of what's going to happen now what I want to do is spend a few minutes just showing you some real property examples because I want you to understand that the bullshit being spoken about property prices are fine, everything's wonderful, property prices are going up is rubbish. Let me give you a few examples. This is one from South Melbourne, 3205. The current advertised sale price, so that's what they're officially saying the price will be, is 2.475 million. The last sale was 2.633 million in March 2017 that's a lot lower and bear in mind that if you actually bought that back then you would have paid 148,000 in stamp duty plus all the other fees so you can see there that that property is already several hundred thousand dollars down and there's no guarantee that they will actually be able to get that price they may have to take a lower price now if you look at my data for that one and I publish this data for every postcode across Australia you can see there that there are 6,000 households and of that there's around 12.5% 12, 12 in mortgage stress but look at this there's 44.8% in rental stress and 58% of investors stressed I suspect this probably gives you a bit of reason as to why things are where they are here's another one Turak top end of the market you know prime suburb and of course everybody's been saying prime markets never fall rubbish they do here's an example current advertised sale price 5.5 million it sold in August 2018 at 7.205 million so that's a huge drop and if you look at the data there even in this postcode this pristine postcode of Turak 30% of owners are in mortgage stress and 22% of investors are in stress don't believe what people tell you look at individual data look at the evidence on the ground remember that this is an advertised sell price this isn't necessarily what it will be sold for and this is all publicly available information if you know where to look and yet most people have no idea about what's going on here's another example Parramatta this is actually on the market for 550,000 it's a you know one bed one bath one space apartment flat unit um, massive price reduction said the agent from 651,700 sold then in 2015 but due to unforeseen circumstances it must go massively reduced to 550,000 yeah there's one of millions in Church Street and the surrounding areas that are on the market at the moment many people who are property investors are catching a cold and here's an example mortgage stress is only 16.7 percent but look at this rental stress in this postcode is at 69.8 percent and the percentage of investors living in the area is 75 percent so property investors and renters are catching a cold no wonder we're seeing this in the market and I suspect that the sale price would be above 
the final settlement price if it was sold. There are so many properties all the same on the market. This is a problem when you buy new units. And when units are looking the same as each other and they're all on the market at the same time, pushes prices down. And there are examples over in this area where prices are down 20 to 25% from their peak. Another one, Sydney Olympic Park, New South Wales. This is a quick flip example. So it's basically um, at 1.018. Now, that was last changing hands at 1.018 million in April 2020. It's on the market again. Um, why? Well, you wonder why people are having to sell. Well, could it be something to do with the fact that we've got 49.6% in mortgage stress, we've got 54.5% in rental stress, and we've got 57.5% of investors in investor stress. And there are, again, many properties in the area on the market. Uh, prices are going down. Um, this is, you know, this is the true, real evidence of what's going on. Or go down to Tasmania. You know, Tasmania, um, people keep saying, oh, Tas is booming. No, it's not. Here's an example. It's a four bed, two bath, no garage, reduce offers over 359,000. Property sale history, December 2015 at 445,000. And guess what? We're seeing some early signs now of stress, not huge relative to other, but look, this is an example of prices falling in Tasmania. And again, if you look carefully, you'll see plenty of examples of prices going down. Now, if you go to another example, Richmond in Victoria, um, this is uh, 1.25 million current advertised price. It was actually in November 2016 at 1.474 sold. It's three beds, one bath, so it's a little cottage. And, um, you know, nothing has happened since 2016, and that's the current advertised price. There is lots of evidence that I can show you that prices are not doing what the media is saying they're doing. 35% in mortgage stress, 28% in rental stress, 47% of investors who are stressed. Many people are bailing out. Or North Melbourne, here's one again. Um, auction by virtue, by virtual auction 1.2 to 1.35 million. It sold at 1.5 in 2017, February 2017, so another loss. Two beds, two baths, two garages. And again, look at the data 37.5% in mortgage stress, 57.9% in rental stress, 75% in investor stress. This is another example of why prices are going down. Oh, going to Queensland. You think Queensland's immune? No, it's not. Here's a three bed, two bath, two garage place. Reduced to sell, only 325,000. Is that good? Bad? Who knows? Well, look at the price. It sold in three, 310,000 in December. 2005, so in 15 years, almost no movement if you allow for stamp duty and uh, other transaction costs. And guess what up there? Well, the data is showing that 54.4% of renters are in stress and 33% of investors are stressed. I'm almost certain this will be a rental property that's uh, being disposed of. Or go to Queensland again. This is an Ascot uh, in Queensland at five beds, four baths, three garages. You know, sounds quite a large place. Overs. Offers over 3.49 million. It sold in March 2010 for 3.95 million. So in fact, it's already down. And again, another example over 10 years. Um, you know, no, nothing really happening in terms of value. And again, you can see there that half of the investors are stressed. A third of renting uh, are in stress, and 20% are have mortgage stress. Um, you need to look detailed. You need to look granular to really get what's going on. I could go on. I'll just go up to the Northern Territory. Here's a massive eight bed, three bath, eight car space. Advertised sale price, $519,000. Sold in July 2015 for $615,000. Um, what's going on? Well, um, you know, there is signs of stress, not huge, but this is to show you that in the Northern Territories, prices have dropped. In fact, they've dropped more than in Perth. What about New South Wales, Lakemba, closer in? Because people would say to me, well, a lot of your data is sort of outlying areas or regionals. No, well, yeah, here's Lakemba, right? Close in, 2195, four bed, two bath, four garage, 1.09 on the market. Advertised, sold, 1.1 million in February 2018. So, in fact, it's going backwards. And remember, that's the asking price. That's not necessarily the uh, settlement price. 69.9% in rental stress, 44% in investor stress, 14.3% in mortgage stress. These are huge, huge 
factors which are driving price falls. Middle Swan, Western Australia. Thought you'd have, thought I might have forgotten W8. Well, here's three bed, two bath, one garage. Reduce to clear, 249,000. I think that extra zero is probably not correct. Um, it sold in March 2006 for 247,000. So there's no profit there to be had. Many people, of course, are seeing massive losses if they bought more recently. And look again, the data is saying 32% of investors are stressed. Some rental stress, not huge, some mortgage stress. But WA is really feeling it. Remember that prices in Perth and the surrounding area are down more than 21% from their peaks on average. Many are down further. Mandra are down 38%. Hawthorne, South Australia. So I've covered uh, pretty much all the states now. Two bed, two bath, um, one uh, car space. Here, look, stress is a lot lower, 21% in mortgage stress, 23% in rental stress, 18% in investor stress. But what's happened? Well, reduced $250,000. Sold in October 2016, 245,000. So there's almost no gain there. And remember that the price reduced doesn't mean that that's the price it's going to be sold for. I could go to Blacktown, three beds, one bath, two garage spaces. Property was sold recently. They don't disclose what happens when a property is sold for at least uh, three months. Uh, that's one of the ploys, particularly where prices are settled lower than the asking price. Uh, those are just not disclosed at all until the uh, official data is forced out into the, uh, into the market once the uh, settlement is uh, recorded by the registries. Um, but it's sold in um, July 2020 for 649. Now the question is, is that the current price? Probably not. Prior to that, in October 2016, it was 635. So whatever way you look at it, nothing much is happening in terms of value. 44% of investors stressed, 68% of renters stressed, 47.7% of uh, people with mortgages in mortgage stress. No surprise. Blacktown is one of those areas where I'm watching the situation very clearly as prices continue to fall particularly on some of the older properties. They're still building new properties there. They're still building high-rise properties there. It's nuts. We've got an oversupply in these areas, and yet there are still more. And, of course, the New South Wales government recently announced an initiative to build extra houses and to stimulate the construction sector once again. Or Collingwood in Victoria. Um, we won't do too many more of these because I've got many examples, but I hope you take the point. Collingwood, four beds, four baths, no car, private sale. 1.69 million sold in March 2018 for 2 million. So hang on a moment. From 2 million in 2018 to 1.6 now. That's actually quite typical of what we're seeing in a number of areas. Prices are down, prices are down. And again, look at the data. 27% of investors, 17% of rental uh, stress, 14% of mortgage stress. So not the most stressed area, but nevertheless significant falls. There were a lot of people who bought uh, you know, in th around 2017, 2018, expecting significant growth, and it's all gone terribly pear-shaped. And just one more in Queensland, three beds, one bath, four cars, advertised price 790000 sold in February 2019 of 1.17 million. That's a huge drop. And again, you're seeing 51% of investors stressed, 55% of renters stressed, 25% of mortgage uh, households in mortgage stress and this is one other which I'll just go for South Kiama sort of down in the regional areas four beds two baths two cars asking 1.25 mil sold at 1.4 in October 2016 and uh, what you can see there is that 44 percent of renters are stressed, 42% of mortgage holders are stressed, and 23% of investors are stressed. No surprise to see drops. We're seeing it pretty much all the way down the coast, and so regional centres are being impacted as well as close in. And, um, you know, I could go on. I won't go on through the rest of these, but just, just to illustrate the point that there are many, many, many examples. Maybe I'll just do Carlton because that's quite interesting. Carlton was five beds, three baths, one car place, 1.5 in... Um, current asking price, December 2016, 1.6, so it's lower. Of course, Carlton's quite close in. And 55% um, of investors stressed, 47% of renters stressed, 17.6% of mortgage in stress. And we could go on. I'm, you know, I won't go all through these in detail because this could take all day. 
But you get the point. Wherever you look, Seven Hills, New South Wales, three beds, one bath, two car spaces, 720,000 asking, 735,000 in 2016. And again, 38% of investors stressed, 72% of renters stressed, 17.6% of mortgage holders in mortgage stress. It goes on and on and on. Wherever you look across the country, you can see the same story again and again and again. Western Australia, 349,000 compared with 415,000 in 2013. And again, high levels of stress. Wherever you look, you can see the same story. Quick flips going on all over the place. This is one up in New South Wales, um, 1.05 in May 2020, and now on the market again. And we can go on and on and on. Now, the point I want to make is that you've got to understand that there's something very important going on. And this is my survey-driven scenario analysis. This is my estimation of what's going to happen over the next three years, two to three years, with regard to property prices. And I rate a number of different scenarios, and then I give them a, a probability. So there is an RBA baseline scenario. If everything went as the RBA hopes, there is a small chance of a price rise, plus five, or maybe down five over the next two or three years. Unemployment would have to come down to around 7%. And uh, there would be bank losses, not huge, but I give that a 5% rating down from 10% last time I did the model. The best case, you know, if everything went really, really well, I think we're probably looking at unemployment around 7.5% because unemployment is going to actually stay with us for many years. This is not going to be V-shaped recovery. Even if we get COVID under control, and of course COVID is not under control at the moment, down 5 to 15% for house prices and 20% probability a longer term crunch now is what I'm thinking is likely to be here because of the fact that COVID is still there and because the economic repercussions will be with us for many years. So I always say we go down the escalator, but we have to come up the stairs when it comes to unemployment rates. 8.75% estimated at that unemployment rate. We would have down 15 to 30% across the country. These are averages, some higher, some lower. 45% probability. So you can see that my probability is building down this part of the the page, a second wave disruption. If the second wave disruption continues and grows, which is quite likely what I'm seeing in Victoria, now in spots in New South Wales and in Queensland, we could be down 30 to 45% over the next two or three years. And uh, that gives 25% uh, weighting. And, you know, if, if this thing really gets under control and we get a huge economic um, downturn that runs, uh, you know, beyond where people are expecting, we could see property prices down a lot further. My point here, these are just to give you relative indicators. It is clear to me that the chances of property going higher ahead is pretty low. So what I say to people is this, if you are actually holding property at the moment and you're sitting on equity and you are thinking that you might want to release some of that equity, do it sooner rather than later. If you're a first time buyer, who's actually thinking of taking up the government's 95% offer, they've announced they're going to probably extend it and get those very low interest rates because I can buy now. Just be cautious, bearing in mind that your income is potentially under pressure because unemployment is likely to rise from this point. And remember also that the incentive schemes that are out there are designed to stimulate the construction sector. You, as a first-time buyer, are the bait. And so just be really careful and really cautious. And if you are in mortgage stress, if you are actually having difficulty with those mortgage repayments, one of the things I say to people is it's really important to, you know, do a bit of cash flow, work out what the scenario is that you're dealing with, then go talk to your bank. They will try and help, but the bank is now under instructions to have conversations that says, if you think your income is going to be um, you know, coming back relatively soon, we can help in terms of restructuring the loan, interest only, those sorts of things. Interest only, by the way, is quite dangerous. But if, in fact, your income is threatened long term, and perhaps you know you were relying on two jobs and only one job in the family, this creates the need potentially to create um, an exit strategy. And again, what I'm saying to people is it's worth thinking very hard. Now, if you want to, if you're living in an unoccupied property and you want to live there for the long term and you are happy to ride the 
escalator down and accept that property prices will drop, then fine, make that an informed decision. If you're a property investor and you do the calculations based on everything that I've seen, property investment is over as an investment class for a number of years. Um, the chances are that rentals will continue to drop. The demand for property investors uh, for, from renters for property uh, is, is also falling off. And I'm expecting that in some places, for example, uh, I've noticed that in some places they're now starting to buy or take rental property off the market. And it's in some cases being used for social housing uh, or it's being used for other purposes. We've got way too much investment property. And if you are thinking of buying an investment property off the plan, particularly in a high rise, stop. Don't do it. You'll be making probably one of the biggest financial mistakes you could make. This is not the time to be getting into property investment because I need you to understand all of my data here shows simply three things. One is property does not always go up. Secondly, as Harry said, in the cycle that we're in at the moment, the chances are prices will fall. And you know, nobody can be sure about how quickly they will fall. My own view, it's going to be two to three years and a sort of a grind down. But we've already seen from the case studies that I've shown you today that in some cases, property is already falling and it's going to fall further. Be really cautious. Be really careful. Don't believe the media hype. Remember that many of the media companies are directly linked to the real estate companies. And as a result, when they start reporting all of this stuff, all the indices, they're going to put a positive spin on it all the time. When you talk to real estate agents, many of them will put a positive spin or will start hiding. I was talking to somebody the other day who said, I've been trying to get price data for a particular area and none of the real estate agents will tell me what's going on. That's a sign that real estate agents are under distress. And of course they are because their volume is way down and because prices are falling. So I guess my summary for today is simply this. Property doesn't always go up. There are probably more risks in the property sector than I've ever seen. And it gives me no pleasure. I have no vested interests in property or anything. I simply look at the data, look at my surveys, look at what I'm seeing and just tell the story because I want people to be informed. I want people to understand that property is risky. It is as risky as many other classes of investment. Property does not always double every seven years, despite the fact that half of the people in my survey still believe it. Even with the data I've shown today, people will still say, no, 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 you're wrong. You've cherry picked the examples. Your surveys are wrong. No, my surveys are dead right. They've been showing this for some time. It's all coming through. And what I'd say is that, um, you know, keep a track on what's going on, because the fact is that these um, scenarios will get updated. And just so you know, if you want to get information about individual postcodes, I actually do have that available via my Patreon channel. You can actually get data for every postcard in the country in terms of stress. I've got a lot of people who do that. Um, worth thinking about if you want to get some information. Or if you want a single postcard, just drop me an email via my DFA blog and uh, I'm happy to provide that information for free if you want to make a donation, fine. Because I want people to be informed. I think being informed is critical at this stage. Um, by the way, people can also support me via PayPal. Some people do that. Thanks for that. But my point is that if you want to get more information about all of this stuff and what's going on, go across to my YouTube channel, What the World DFA, and there you can see information about China and about the financial system and about what politicians are doing. But more importantly, you can follow my analysis with regard to property. Remember this, property can go down and property is likely to go down from here because the economic environment that we're in, as Harry said earlier on, is as negative as I've seen it. Unemployment high, COVID still raging, financial system to bilio thanks to the massive QE stimulus. This is all going to come out in the wash, not in the next three months, not in the next six months. This is a two or three year thing. Be prepared, be ready, get yourself informed, make the right decisions to protect your wealth and to protect your family. This is probably the most important message I've ever left with anybody because I think that the um, crisis is really coming and it's coming through and it's coming very soon. So there you have it. My best attempt to describe what's going on today. 
I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.